Uh, before I let you go, I want to uh, get your thoughts on, uh, you know, Skip Bayless. His final day mm. on Undisputed was uh, last Friday. Steve, he did not say a farewell on air. Uh, he did not his address his departure on air. Uh, my understanding is that uh, the executives and the people at Fox wanted him to address his departure on air. He refused uh, because he's angry at them and he blames them for uh, not negotiating peace between Skip and Shannon Sharp. Mm. He's now blaming the executives at Fox Sports uh, rather than perhaps himself. And, and so he wouldn't address his departure on air. He put out a tweet shortly after leaving the air saying that, you know, that was his final day and he's on to bigger and better things. Uh, two questions here. Do you like the way he exited? And is Skip Bayless's television career over? Skip Bayless is a Sinatra. He's going to do it his way. So it, in that sense, I guess I respect it. But let's go back to what you said. He should not be blaming the executives for not brokering peace with Shannon Sharp. Here's what he should have done if he really cherished that relationship. And he understood that there was a certain chemistry that they developed. How about just treating your partner better to a point where he does not want to walk off? Some of those exchanges, especially the one where he said, you're not Tom Brady and put your glasses back on. You know, Skip, Skip caused this. He's the one that caused the divorce. He's the one that had Shannon Sharp venturing and looking at other options. And looks like Shannon Sharp has done pretty doggone good for himself. So that right there, I completely disagree with Skip. That you caused this issue. You should have been a little bit more respectful towards your partner because that show was a partnership. Let's get that correct. The other thing is, you know, I think it's strange, Jason, how this thing just kind of went out with a whimper and not a bang. I mean, say what you want about Skip, whether you hate him, love him, or loathe him. He's impactful. He has been very important to this genre, for better or worse. And to just kind of say, okay, uh, see you whenever, with no celebration, with no tributes, nothing. It, it kind of reminds me of these boxing careers where, like, even the great Ray Robinson kind of wound down um, in Tijuana, losing to fighters that he never would have used as sparring partners. It just seems kind of underwhelming. But, Jason, we spoke about this last year when they tried to revive this show with a cast of thousands. He was left as an outsider on his own show. I think they added too many people. I think they should have kept it very simple. Less would have been more. All you really needed was Michael Irvin and maybe another guy. You didn't need all those other people and I lost interest in that show when it didn't have the playmaker on. And I saw segments where he's just a guy sitting out in right field doing nothing for 20 minutes at a time. It didn't even feel like his own show. But I go back to what I said. Um, this was something that he caused because of the way he treated his partner. And do I think his television career is over? In terms of being with a major traditional broadcast network, yes. But as we've seen, traditional media now is taking a backseat to independent media. But as you've seen by his YouTube numbers, that may not be his core audience. Yeah, listen, you said is impactful. I would say was impactful. Okay. And I would That's say fair. that his impact was, hey, I'm at ESPN. And virtually anybody that's on ESPN during that time frame was impactful, particularly back when it wasn't for any and everybody. When before Mina Kimes, before Sarah Spain, before Pablo Torre and Bomani Jones, and just any and yeah. everybody, regardless of level of accomplishment. Right. Yeah, but, but it, it's just like there used to be like, oh, well, Tony Kornheiser and Mike Wilbon. They were such accomplished journalists that they're on ESPN's platform, blah, blah, blah. Skip Bayless, early adopter. And it's like, it said something significant about it. He's so good and so impactful. He's on ESPN. Next thing you know, every Tom, Dick, and Harry is on ESPN. 
<laughs> and oh, this person has a blog, or this person once wrote an article for some organization we have no idea, blah, blah, is now on ESPN, they're just blah, 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 blah. And so once that got diluted, and now people are having to stand on their own two feet. So to me, Skip struck while the fire was hot, and he rode that wave uh, from being an early adopter and someone that got identified early, but Skip has never been a skilled or talented or even likable broadcaster or anyone that's really all that provocative beyond the fact his willingness to uh, take on uh, LeBron James, someone who got identified as, hey, don't criticize this person. And he took him on at a time when uh, LeBron was actually far easier to defend than he is now. When LeBron was halfway yeah. likable and doing a lot of great things when Skip was trashing him, and that made him kind of interesting. Uh, but now, I, I don't, outside of you know, corporate media, outside of uh, the benefit of ESPN or Fox Sports saying, hey, you should listen to this guy, I don't know if Skip Bayless has anything impactful to say or provocative or even interesting to say off of those platforms. And, and so, you know, to me, this was inevitable and seven years, eight years in the making that it was going to crash and burn this way. A, 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 a then, let's say, 64-year-old white guy to now 71-year-old white guy trying to pass himself off as part of the hip hop culture, that was unsustainable. <laughs> that was, un and, and Shannon, yeah. again, what he should have realized is like, wow, based on the lane and brand that I've chosen, Shannon's carrying me. I, I, I can't be in this hip hop lane because when he was with Stephen A. Smith, it was less of a hip hop lane and it was more, hey, these are two newspaper journalists. He came over to FS1 and partnered with a non-journalist, an athlete, and they turned it into a hip-hop show. And an and a, a old white guy is the face of a hip-hop show? That I can't believe the death took this yeah. long. And to me, it's why the peak of it was never that high, despite all the promotion and all the work they did trying to hype him up. They topped out averaging 220,000 viewers, and then as soon as they removed the pin, uh, Shannon Sharp, they started getting forty and 50,000 viewers. It's inevitable. Yeah, I, I mean, Jason, there's no doubt. Look, it was admittedly cringeworthy to see Skip uh, just pander and what he did, saying stuff like Shadur Standards may be the best player in college football. He actually spoke last year. I, I know we have plenty of time to talk about Prime coming up, that Colorado, after their 2-0 start, they might be in the playoffs. And to that I go, Jim Mora, playoffs? Play, you kidding me? Playoff? And that, that thing fell apart. I mean, the pandering was so bad, I halfway expected him to show up in a Kangol hat and some Carl Kanai or some Aniche clothing. I, I mean, because I, I would look at these pictures of him showing off his Jordans, like, oh, he's a cool old white guy. You know, there's nothing cool about a cool old white guy trying that hard to be the cool old white guy. Like me, I lean into the fact I'm just an old codger now. I mean, look at this hair. I am what I am. I'm not changing. That's going to be my brand, but I'm not going to try to be something that I'm not. But let me give Skip Bayless some credit, Jason. On my bookcase and my book collection, there's a lot of Skip Bayless um, from God's Coach and to other books related to the Dallas Cowboys of the 90s. I think he's an absolute must read. I know there's a lot of harsh feelings from several Cowboy players led by Troy Aikman, and I get it. I am not arguing that. But when I read these books, I felt like, wow, I kind of know the history or the inside baseball of that organization. And I thought he was very provocative. I thought he was very entertaining. And I give him credit. I thought he had a very good career, at least as a writer. He did. I think a lot of that, what you said, is true. Uh, it, it's it's. Uh, let's let me ask you this, Steve. If if Skip Bayless had embraced being the curmudgeonly white guy. Yes. Who was the polar opposite of the hip-hop black athlete, Shannon Sharp. 
the role oh. Shannon Sharp was playing. I think that would have been better TV. Yes. But I think Skip got bullied by today's modern culture that like, oh, I'm not, if I'm that, I'll be reviled. And Twitter and everybody will call me racist. And so I don't want to be that. So he tried to be something that he's not. And so there would have been a personal consequence if he had played the role that is actually natural and authentic to him. Commerging. Older guys yeah. like, man, I really don't get this hip hop stuff. And that's your thing, Shannon. And I'm trying to understand it, but would have been more successful. But instead, he tried to make that group of people love him. And he paid with little Wayne a bunch of money to, <laughs> to make them love. Him, and it just didn't work. He, he didn't get either advantage. <laughs> well, they got a catchy theme song out of it. OK, but you're right. The. <laughs> Authenticity was not there. There were things that Skip said beyond sports that you said, wow, he's either the guiltiest white liberal or he's being a phony fraud. And I think that the core audience of middle America just said, we're not listening to this guy. Wag the finger and tell us that we are flawed people who are racist. I think there's a part of it that is absolutely true. Uh, I mean, Jason, to, uh, to swing this back to me, yeah, you're right. I, I love being the Korean curmudgeon. I'm going to give you my opinion. I'm not going to go out there and form my opinion to please the audience. I think once the appeal, uh, the appeal of Skip Bayless was at one time long ago, he gave his opinion. And whether you agreed or disagreed with that, you said, you know what, that's what he thinks. I hate this guy. I cannot stand him. And I'm going to watch him every day. But once he started to become inauthentic, he no longer became must-see TV for those who once did enjoy him. Steve, give me an early thought on this, because we may have to discuss this at some other point in more detail. But it, it feels FS1 is now forced to, and, you know, forced to sounds negative, but they're, they're all in on Cal and Cowherd. He has all the leverage now, and... Mm -hmm. My understanding is they're going to build him a second studio out in Chicago so that he can work from Chicago some of the time. I think his, he and his wife own a home in Chicago. Uh, that's going to be part of it. Uh, but also there are reports now that they there's early reporting from Mike McCarthy that uh, Nick Wright is going to be the face of FS1 and its leading personality or one of its leading personalities, it, it's, it, and it's quite interesting how they, anyway, I'll just leave it at there. What do you think about a Colin Cowherd, Nick Wright combination as the face of FS1? Will that be more or less successful than Cowherd and Skip Bayless? I mean, the filleting of LeBron's going to be unbearable. I mean, even more unbearable <laughs> than it is now. I mean, you might as well just call that clutch talk. I must just be honest about it. I mean, look, on Twitter, with guys like Apex Jones, who have made a pretty good living on Twitter, being anti-LeBron, and by the way, Apex, hell of a job. You're, you're, you're doing God's work there. Though I will say this. They're going to cause a buzz because the people that are so anti-LeBron and pro-Michael Jordan, who are the good guys, they're going to get a lot of content off of them. But again, I wonder, though, in the long term, in the long run, because LeBron's not going to play forever and he's much closer to the end than the beginning, is that sustainable? That's the question. I, I don't think it is. I'm not talking about Cowherd, but, you know, Nick Wright is cut from the Bomani Jones cloth and Jamel Hill cloth and uh, some of the other cloth of been thrown in a microwave, haven't accomplished much, and their entire brand is based off the marketing of the television network. And that only has so much life. If you enjoyed that video, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe so you never miss a moment of Fearless.